Uh, great. I've had apologies from um, Lisa Ailing as well. Uh, so we are an academy rep down and um, the post-16 uh, rep will be Mike Kilbride going forward, but he's unable to come tonight as well. So that's good. OK, if we're ready to start. Um, in a, in a moment, uh, we're, we're going to skip introductions um, because everybody, if you use the people icon at the top of the screen, you can see who's here and that will give you an idea and we will introduce the speakers as we go. Uh, if you can bear in mind that this is a, a meeting that will be broadcast, that is public meeting, so if we can just use the right protocols, please, and if you would indicate that you would like to speak, if you can use the hand up icon, which is in the reactions box at the top of your screen. And if anybody has any issues using the hand up icon, if you just put it into the chat box and we will try to pick those up as we go. If we can refrain from putting things into the chat box unless they're going to be um, part of the conversation uh, until the end, that will be really good as well because it helps me keep the questions going to the presenters. So. If with with that in mind, if we can uh, start the meeting, um, if we can have any other apologies, do we do, do we know of any other apologies? I've got uh, Lisa Ailing and Mike Kilbride as the new post sixteen rep. Um, a couple that I've received as well, Chair. Uh, one from Chris Mervin. Um, uh, Geraldine Fraser has also sent apologies as well. Uh, like it's been put in the chat, uh, Sue Ralph um, is running a bit late and will be joining us soon. Um, but I'm not aware of any other apologies other than that. Wow. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, OK, if we can move on then to uh, the mi the minutes of the meeting. And if we can take minutes, minutes and matters arising as we go. Uh, has everybody ac got access to uh, the minutes and the agenda? Or would you like us to share the screen? If anybody, we if you anybody needs the screen share, just show your hand or make a comment. If not, we will skip through. Uh, anything then from page one of the minutes? Okay, page two. Page three. Page four. Page five. OK, would somebody care to approve those as a true record? I'll approve them, Adrian, if you want. Thank you, John. So we'll take that and then no other matters arising. Uh, Trish, you've put your hand up. No, it's all right, Adrian. I was just going to approve them. <laughs> OK, thanks, Trish. Uh, OK, so if we can then move on to uh, Jen's item four, which is the uh, report from Trish. Good evening, everybody. Um, excuse me, I've only just literally got back in. It's been a bit of a busy day, but I'm sharing my screen. But I know you've already got the report. Um, is it sharing? Is it coming through? It, it's not currently sharing, Trish. Would you like it to be shared? I, th I think everybody's got access to the papers. Okay. All separate if everybody's got access, it doesn't matter. I'll just read through from page seven. I think everybody in the meeting is conscious about the role of um, the local authority when it comes to children looked after. It's a statutory responsibility to have a virtual head. Um, around that virtual head, it's expected that there be a team of people. Um, and the remit of the team is to try and close the education gap for children looked after and their peers through use of additional funding called Pupil Premium Plus, that specifically to enhance the educational outcomes for looked after children. Pupil Premium Plus currently stands at £2,410, of which a virtual school keeps 410 and 2000 goes directly to schools to um, support the children within the school. The team is funded partially through Pupil Premium Plus and partially through some other grants. So on page eight, you can see a breakdown 
of the current staffing situation in the LACES team and how they're funded. Um, you can see a breakdown at the bottom there, the 4.08 full-time staff members are funded by DSG, 1.83 members are funded by the Virtual Head Teacher Extension Grant, one is funded by the Virtual Head Grant and 1.36 is funded by Children Looked After Pupil Premium Plus. That awful acronym is Pupil Premium Plus. Um, then we have additional funding coming in this year as well. And we've got 100K for added responsibilities for the cohort of children in need or child protection. We've already got additional funding of about 66,000, 66 66.6 for the responsibility of providing support and guidance around previously looked after children. We've also had a series of funding streams to try and um, address loss of education during pandemic, one of which is recovery funding and the other one is school-led tuition. I'll explain how we're using some of those funding streams at the moment. There was an understanding of Pupil Premium Plus, but we have to disperse that out of school. So if in any financial year there's an underspend, we have to make sure that it's not clawed back by the government. So we distribute it to schools and they all got £450, I think, last the close of the financial year per looked after child. Of the Pupil Premium Plus side of the budget, um, as I said, it's £2,410, 410 of which is used its top slice. It comes to the virtual school. It does um, pay for partially staff. It pays for Sarah, who's now effectively known as the deputy. And £2,000 goes to schools in two allocations, £1,000 in the autumn term and £1,000 at, at the, in the summer term. In total, the £2,000 going to school adds up to £1,258,000 and top slice come to the virtual school is about a quarter of a million pound. Um, there's a breakdown in the graph that shows you just the proportions of pupil premium plus that goes to school. The amounts aren't in that. We're working with Liquid Logic to try and get the amounts in there to represent it, but it gives you a fair indication of where schools are using this money most in TA support, tuition and an SEMH support. Any questions about that, I'll answer in a sec. Of the top slice, it comes to the virtual school. We do currently have to pay for an attendance collection tool that costs us 40 to 45k a year depending on the amount of children looked after resources for teachers have amounted to 30,000 pound alternative provision for children without an EHCP that we've had to pay for to help schools in certain situations staffing in the virtual school we do use a provider called Randstad and we have commissioned them a number of years ago and um, and we've used them as our chosen provider on all the tuition funding streams and I think currently allocated is, is just the difference because that, that we'll still have um, invoices and resources to purchase during the year. Impact of the LACES team is really good completion of PEPs. The 98% there needs updating. It actually comes to about 100% because there are only six PEPs complete during the year. 95% of those are good quality or better. There have been no PEM access from schools. Every school visited um, by the team to develop relationships and provide support and challenge and raise aspirations of progress of looked after children. We're all children in care. Now, this is based on the last validated data catch in 2019. So we, we uh, wait for the outcomes this year, really, to be able to advise about whether children in care are making better progress or not. We've worked with colleagues and data teams and we've now got reporting systems that allow anybody to see at an instant glance, how we're doing with completion and um, with progress and everything else. And I think um, relationships between schools and social care have really developed. Recovery funding, I, um, it's about £145 per child. I sent an email out to school saying if anybody wanted that, I was um, providing they can evidence how they've used it and the impact it's had. Otherwise, I would pool it. We put that pool of money. There was only one school came back and said they, they wanted the money because their students wouldn't benefit from tuition. But then they subsequently declined because they didn't want to show um, they I think there was a, a partial reluctance about the evidence trail around it. 
So all the recovery funding is with Randstad, who use a system called Opus. And in August this year, I'll have to take the information from the Opus system that Randstad set up for us and put it into a DFE database that they'll send out in August. We won't have used all that, I don't think, but there are still plans during the summer term to access more support for the children. School-led tuition was more difficult to use because the intention of school-led tuition was really that schools were able to manage their own tuition and providing staff to hold tuition groups after school. Of course, the virtual school's not in that position, so we've struggled a little bit more then, but on the recent guidance that came out at the end of April has opened um, the remit up a little bit more to enable a bit more creativity around how we use it. So I'm hoping that there'll be some um, access to the school-led tuition there, and we've also provided some support for our secondary schools with the very high numbers of children looked after in the form of a, a teacher or a TA for the rest of this term. And I've worked with uh, our contract at Randstad to lobby the DfE about, again, opening up how this money can be utilised to really provide the bespoke support that the children need. We don't get many in secondary taking up additional tuition after school. Um, now, in reserve, in our reserve fund, there was enough funding there to provide two additional members of staff. The situation we've got at the moment, because of added responsibilities of previously looked after child children in need and child protection, the girls have got really high numbers on their cohort, so we need some additionality in the team to enable us to work more effectively with schools and that close one-to-one -one support between school and social care we can put in. When it gets to this point in the year, the girls are just constantly pushing PEPs onto the system, quality assuring them, checking them, getting them on the system. And it, it does diminish the amount of support we can get because they've got up to 150 children on their cohort, which is just a little bit too big to manage. And I think that is the end of my gobbled um, whistle-stop tour of the report so that I could answer any questions if necessary. Thanks for that, Trish. Uh, thank you for putting that report to, uh, together. Uh, has anybody got any questions uh, that jump out? I have one, Trish. Is Are these uh, roles permanent or part-time or uh, fixed terms? They're fixed term, Adrian, simply because it's grant funding. We can never guarantee grant funding. But the previously looked after funding is also um, government funding, and that's gone on now into its fourth year. So the um, vacancy advert has said fixed term and we do get people inquiring, but we're not allowed to say that it's permanent because it's government funding. OK, and a, a second question would be, um, is some of that grant fund is subject to clawback? So how much yeah. do you expect to be clawed back at the end of this year? The previously looked after and the SIN and CP funding isn't. Um, it's section 31, I think Asaka will correct me if she's here, um, which means it doesn't get clawed back. The Pupil Premium Plus does and the recovery and the school led tuition does. So we've got to try and spend those creatively. Um, and the latest advice from Matthew Cook was to consider everything that's been spent in the financial year and see which of that can be um, put under the school tuition part, but that's going to be a massive task for the summer. So I won't be going to Ibiza. I don't think I've, I've got enough to do because we'll have to go through all the peps and think where we spent this money, what tuition can be um, put down as school led, which will give us a little bit of leeway with the pupil premium plus to use that then up to the end of March. Okay, I'm, I'm conscious uh, that um, in years gone by, some of that um, people premium plus has been pushed out towards the end of the year to schools where they've shown a need. Is that the plan for this? Um, that's what we've done with the school led tuition currently. But when we know exactly where we are, I'm I'm hoping that we can continue the kind of funding or the kind of support we've put in just now. Hopefully on. I don't know if I'll manage a bigger scale, but certainly to give children time to transition into the next school year, 
or it remains to be seen. It, it There are two things that will affect that. The amount of school-led tuition that we can claim back as having been spent during the year and the answers we get from the DfE from, um, her name is Karen Guthrie. She's the, she's taken over the National Tutoring Programme uh, remit with Randstad and I think you'll be aware they did have the contract initially they've subsequently lost it but she's my font of all wisdom when it comes to anything NTP wise so she's going to actually put some questions to the DFE around it and hopefully get some answers quite soon but Pretty pupil premium bad. plus any any leftovers is usually on a needs basis unless the the amount of funding means that each child can get a, a, a good sum back and and the last time we did it they were all getting 450 to schools. Uh, John, John, you've got a question. Yes, uh, just, just a quick one. Um, recruiting additional uh, EPOs, how do we compare with all the local authorities regarding caseload and numbers of uh, EPOs? We compare not too well. Um, NAVISH, the National Association of Virtual School Heads, put up a picture of the average virtual school and the average cohort, without dragging the form back up just now, I think most, um, they're all called different names, most LACES workers had between 80 and 110 children on their cohort. So having 150 is quite a massive um, difference, really. It's almost a third more, or, and a, or more than a third in some cases. It also means that I can't... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? I, ca I can't give Sarah many more responsibilities, which means that I also have my, uh, oh God, struggling here. The impact on the time I have to spend on individual children and being strategic is impacted because I can't devolve some of my responsibilities down to Sarah because she has got 150 children on a caseload. She also has the finances and the line management. So, it will be in the secondary sector where we're looking to recruit these additional roles. OK, so realistically, we could do with a few more, possibly two. Yeah. yeah. OK, thank you. Possibly oh. 10, John. <laughs> yeah. we, God loves a try. Uh, yes, um, I'm, I'm just conscious one last point before we move on. Uh, and note that report uh, is that you mentioned that there aren't uh, there are no permanently excluded uh, looked after children, but there are 16 on alternative provision for a significant proportion of their time. And are some of, would it be right to say that some of those are at risk and they, the, the only reason that they haven't been permanently excluded is because that pupil premium funding has been used to fund that alternative provision? And that's something on the radar of, of the whole authority about use of, of alternative provision in this way. Um, there are still a number of fixed term exclusions as well. And I know James, he might want to come in and say something, but the inclusion strategy that's going to be drawn up will be using all professionals involved and, and having including AP within that those conversations. Yeah, I think it's just touching on where the green paper's going into the new academic year and how those link in. So we'll definitely be looking at that and something we're picking up, at Adrian, through the um, alternative provision steering group moving into the next academic year. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Trish. Uh, so uh, we will note that report. There is a, a note on the paper that we, we recommend that further information is provided by schools uh, in how they are using that pupil premium plus in relation to the other category. Yeah. Um, 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 could you explain what you'd like from the schools for that, please, Trish? We don't use the other category just now, but what it was, Adrian, it, schools are still not <clears throat> brilliant at costing out the support that they're putting in for the children. And there are occasions, because we do PEPs kind of projected for a year now, we'll ask them in September what they're going to use £2,000 for in the following year. And they may be using more than that from their own budget, and we have to proportion it then. So we, we intend to do a little bit of work with schools about actually costing that out. We had one school that was employing a teacher to do some additional um, work with children after school, and that teacher was costing £248 an hour. <laughs> So we just indicated that we need to actually 
draw up a list of the costs of staff and how they can utilise these people and some really good practice in PEP writing. We've got a, a PEP refresh day on the 9th of September, I think it is. And what we need to do is, is just get that costing of the support tighter. And then those graphs where we show you the proportion can then show you the amounts because the girls are having to do some maths in their heads just now. OK, so so if we could get that communication out through the uh, primary heads group, through the secondary heads group and through special, um, we will get that message and request clarity of data. And perhaps if we could circulate that training that's available for staff, uh, that would be really good to help us in get that for you. Yeah. And uh, the final uh, action on this report is to do some further investigation into the impact. So is that again related to the, the PEPs and the, the yeah. impact statements on the PEPs? Yeah, we need some validated data, but we've also got a data analyst now as part of the additional responsibilities. And we collect data at the, the beginning and the end of the year. And we want the data from the end of the previous year's data catch when we collect data in September and we want schools to predict what is going to the data is going to look like at the end of the year when we collect data in the summer term. So we want that year's overview. We're still um, because of time slippage, because the girls do spend a, a lot of time um, shouting about getting peps back. We occasionally have a pep due back, well, arriving back with us in December, which gives us a data catch in December, which isn't helpful. We don't want a data catch in December. We want the data catch from the July previously, so we can give a year's impact of pupil premium plus spending. So again, that's going to be addressed in the training session that's coming up in September. But it would also be helpful, Adrian, if I do attend WASH and primary heads and special heads to get that message across to heads as well. Belt I, think, I think that'll be really good because then you can clarify exactly what you need and when the deadlines are. If we have that clear, then we can support you in getting that. And for this to be brought back to uh, forum then, when would you like this to come to forum next so that we can get that picture? Do you want a November or January forum? Which one would be best for you? January, I think, Adrian. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so can we make sure that the minute reflects that we're going to bring this back up on the January agenda? That'd be great. In which case, thank you very much, Trish. Much appreciate your report. Adrian, uh, do you want me to stay or go? Oh, set. So, uh, you're quite welcome to stay if you wish, Trish. But if you were, uh, if you have better things to do, not that I can imagine that there is anything better that you could do than attend one of these meetings. Um, you're more than welcome to stay. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Adrian. Okay. <laughs> so if we can move on then to uh, agenda item five, which is the um, home and continuing education service, Julie. Hi everyone, I um, hope everyone's had a nice day. Um, mine's a fairly short report today, just a sort of brief summary of how things have been over the year for the Home Education Service. Um, a reminder of, of our, our primary aim as, as an alternative provider for those children whose health um, prevents them attending their schools. So in terms of background, we, we, we've had a, a busy year um, and we have um, we have seen a climb in referrals following a decline at the beginning after the closures. We've seen a, a climb in referrals um, from October, September this year, uh, particularly with children in around years seven and eight. Um, really, I would imagine an indication of where their secondary transition didn't didn't happen and they were, their mental health wasn't able to withstand that. So we, we have had a, a climb in numbers um, at the moment. We're, we're over 100, which is unusual for the service. We're 115 and we're busy trying to make sure we give all those um, families as much support and the children as, as we can. So, so we've had a change um, of, of, of profile in terms of the children are younger than they're the lower secondary age. Um, we're also going to have a change of venue. Um, we're going to be moving to Pilgrim Street, which is a lovely opportunity for us to be able to support the families in a much more holistic way with all our, our colleagues from youth and engagement there. So that's exciting. 
Um, another change that we've had this year has been brought about by the LGO, and that was about our eligibility criteria. Um, and that was to do with the fact that when we have children, we ask for a medical support um, and we usually ask for that to be from a specialism or a specialist. Um, given the delays often with um, health, being able to see families, particularly in, in the area of mental health and CAMS, we have brought around an interim measure where we will accept um, ex um, referrals or recommendations from more general medical practitioners, um, the, the general practitioners. Um, and that's so that we don't have a delay in the children starting. Obviously, we, whilst they're with us, we will continue to try to get more specialist um, practitioners on board in order to help us with their support. So it's so a slight change in the in the um, eligibility criteria, but, but not, not huge. We still expect most of our referral, referrals to come from schools with the medical support. Um, there's been a slight increase in the amount of children that we that we support who have EHCPs, but I don't think that's out of kilter with the amount of children with EHCPs generally. So I, I'm not sure that that's anything to worry about for now. Um, in terms of the budget, um, following the the um, the, un, the overspend of last year, this year we've come in online, and I would like to say a, a thank you to all the schools really, because this time last year um, there was an agreement to transfer the pupil premium um, for the year eleven pupils. That's made such a difference, everybody. Um, it's enabled us to put on some enrichment activities on a Thursday afternoon. And we're getting the children together and we're getting out and about around the world. We've walked to Hillbury, uh, we've been to Laser Crest, uh, we've climbed walls, we've eaten um, eaten together and socialised. And that's really made a difference. And I, I can really see that the, the children who attend the enrichment activities have got a far greater chance of going off into post-16 and, and into their adulthood, being able to, to make really successful transitions. So I would I would thank schools for that. And um, if anyone wants to see any of the pictures of the children out and about on the Wirral on a Thursday afternoon, please let me know. So that's that's the change in terms of, of the, um, the budget. Um, there was one other small change and um, uh, it was discussed at WASH, so we thought we'd put it in. At the moment, um, it, it's been the case that in year 11, the, the pupils transfer onto off the, pupil, off the school rolls and onto the AP census. That schools um, and um, have, have decided along with us that, that that's no longer the case. And that's made us think a little bit about the way that year 11 is funded. So traditionally, the transfer of ORPU happened uh, at the beginning of year 11. Um, along with the, the the pupils coming off roll. Now that they are staying on school rolls, I, I don't have any objections to the weekly charge of £125 being applied throughout the year groups. It will make a small um, difference um, in favour of schools, I'm afraid. Um, but um, that's good. I would advice on that but I don't have any I can't see that what, why that would would make a difference to us so um, that would be the only um, change that I would be I would be flagging up from a financial point of view and, and that's it from me uh, thanks Julie so if, if we are going to change that funding agreement that would come down to a vote which is a, a vote for all forum members uh, and if, if I just uh, can be permitted to put the context there. The concern yeah, genuinely please. was that uh, moving all of the ORPU uh, against a child may constitute a move towards off-rolling and I think we all agree that we should only be doing uh, what is in the best interest of the children and, and while the children remain dual registered all the way through to year 11 it would be appropriate for us to keep the weekly funding. Uh, that would be accompanied by a slight change in the model where the Home and Continuing Education Service would be on the portal as another range of alternative provision available in the local authority and school would re retain that pastoral um, commitment to that child all the way through their school years. That's right, isn't it, Julie? That's, that was the underpinning yeah, um, the new model. rationale behind changing that, that funding model. Yeah. So, and, so, and sorry, that, that would go along with the, the you know, the, the 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 concept of AP and SEN being being a, a one a la, one landscape from the from the uh, white paper. Absolutely, so it's, it's part of that graduated response, isn't it, to, to a child's need? Yeah. Uh, so, so rather than a recommendation, we we, we re if we're going to change that funding 
uh, agreement. We, we we need to do that through a vote. So um, if if we can, uh, rather than just consider replacing the transfer of Orpu uh, in year eleven, if we can make that a substantive change and we can move that forward as of the first of mm. September, we will do the weekly charges uh, for all students in home and continuing. Um, education services to be paid in, the, in that model. So yeah, I don't know if I clearly articulated that. So we are just about to have a vote. And if you can use the chat function to say um, whether you um, are for that proposal, um, you abstain or whether you are against that proposal, that would be great. I want uh, forum members to bear in mind that this is predominantly a secondary um, a, a, a secondary function. Um, specialist schools can vote. This is an open vote uh, to, for all forum members uh, because it was part of the voting when we voted to change the pupil premium um, arrangements as well. So the vote would say uh, for those of you who are in favour of moving to a system where the home and continuing education service is funded by a weekly charge rather than an all blue transfer in year 11. If you could write yes into the chat box now. If anybody would like to abstain if you could write abstain into the chat box now. And if anybody is against it, if you could write no into the chat box now. OK, so in, in um, <laughs> thank you, Kate. <laughs> uh, um, uh, if we can get Joe to that would appear to be a unanimous <laughs> yes. So so if we can note that that is the decision of forum to change that and that gives you some certainty going forward, Julie. So that's that's that. Brilliant. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. And, and the second point there is that we will continue to transfer the pupil premium with those yes, children. Please. We don't need to vote on that unless there's anybody would like to make any comments on that. If you'd like to do so, just let me know if there's a comment you'd like to make on that. Otherwise, we will remain the state that will remain the status quo. Great. Okay, thanks, everyone. So, 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 so we have a decision there, Julie. So the funding will go to the weekly charge and you will continue to get the pupil premium for those children. Julie, That's thank really you very much for that report. Much appreciated. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thanks for your patience, everybody there. That was um, that was good. Uh, so if we can now move on to agenda item number six, which is the early years working group, which is Carol. Carol, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm going to um, refer to the early years report, which starts on page 19. I'll take the report as read and we'll just pull out some of the key highlights um, to note and take any questions uh, at the end. Thank you. Um, so it's actually starts uh, section two highlights the take up of funding entitlement across our two, three and four year olds in the early years. Um, and the first point is around our two year offer. We, we have seen um, an in, uh, increase across all take ups, but there has also been a little bit of uh, back and two um, across the last 12 months. So our take up has improved. We are above national, which is 62%, and we're currently sitting at 82%, which is positive, but we still are below where we were pre-pandemic. So we know there is still some work to do on that to, to, to uh, recover um, our two-year-olds into provision. 
Um, and our three and four year olds combined is slightly below national, but there is a national picture around again during the um, COVID um, period and parents are working from home and they were making different childcare choices. Um, so it, some, some parents are taking less uh, of the entitlements or not requiring the entitlements at this time. So there is a very much a mixed economy in terms of why parents are not recovering and uh, children back into their two, uh, two uh, sorry, three, three and four year funding. Um, aside to that, um, uh, and um, we're looking at other, you know, other reasons why the percentages aren't where they were. Um, you'll note in section four, I start to talk about the recruitment and retention and the staffing difficulties that our providers are experiencing across the world. But again, I've referred to some national context there. Um, Children that are in the two year provision, the ratio is one to four. And when you move into your three, four year provision in, in the private and voluntary um, and child minders, then it goes to one to eight. So some some providers are telling us that they're, you know, they're, they're taking less two year olds because it, there's a less staff ratio required. So the numbers are, um, are obviously less. Um, and waiting for those three-year-olds. Um, also, there's uh, waiting lists. Um, not that we haven't got sufficient places or the nurses um, ha haven't got space, um, but again, that's something around the recruitment and retention of staff. Um, so some settings don't have enough staff to meet the demand. Um, and, that's, and we're working with the um, sector on that, as I refer to the workforce development uh, plan there. We're also now in terms of whilst there is sufficiency, so families that may not have the full entitlement uh, as, as they would um, previously, um, rather than they'll contact the Family Information Service um, where we can support and identify another provision. However, some, some parents are choosing that, they'd, that you know, it's probably a little bit too far than what they'd um, originally um, expected for their childcare and therefore they'll wait for a place to become available. Um, or indeed they'll wait if they can get into their F1, uh, the primary school choice or their F2, uh, or wait to F2. So there's a very um, a mixed picture happening across the uh, earlier sector for Wirral at this point in time, uh, one with the take up, and we're working hard with a school ready um, group, which is a multi-agency partnership group and around campaigns. There's been campaigns in the spring, uh, in the spring term um, to promote the readiness for school for this September. And again, we'll be doing that promoting across the summer term to uh, ensure that we are maximising the take up of our funding entitlements. Because of course, we are projecting our budget um, that we draw down from the, from the DfE um, for the funding entitlements to be at a very high percentage so we can maximise the places available to children on Wirral for their earliest years. Um, I also refer within section four to the workforce development group and the activity that's in there and this, the, the group has been really proactive and has recently had a really successful event um, in engaging um, early years as a career um, and working with, with key partners and, and uh, indeed some of our high schools um, and, and contacts um, on, on career choices and that will continue to be um, a real key piece of work uh, as we move uh, further into the uh, into this financial year and supporting settings um, in in how they then bring in you know, new um, staff, how we some, can support as a local authority with um, some of the um, training uh, and that links into section five in terms of bringing new staff in uh, because in, in addition to um, staff uh, early is not being chosen as a career and not being able to retain staff. Another element of that was that some um, providers are telling us when they are recruiting, um, their staff uh, are not necessarily ready for work um, post, the, post the pandemic uh, and there's some functional skills that they're needing some support with. Um, so again, the, the Workforce Development Group is working on that and utilising um, some of our outstanding provision across the world and the expertise that they have and, and, and the depth and knowledge of child development, particularly um, in supporting um, to retain staff into their provisions. Um, moving into section five, it, it talks about the um, where we are in terms of early years, uh, special education on need support for children. Um, we do obviously have a continued pressure 
think we've heard in, in previous reports and the pressures of uh, the needs of children and that that is the remains the case within our early years uh, children um, and the send offices are supporting 400 plus children at this point in time um, with additional support for settings in terms of whether they need that graduated response uh, or whether they're progressing to an uh, um, educational health care assessment. So there's still a um, great, great deal of work being undertaken through the SEND team. That also has, um, in previous reports, noted the continuation pressure on the Inclusive Practice Fund and the over, overspend that we've uh, um, reported on previously, and we've worked to address that so that we can really focus that in this 22-23 uh, budget period. Um, in, and as a result, we've focused on reviewing the Inclusive Practice Fund in guidance and um, ensuring that the graduated response is um, fully applied um, ahead of, of seeking external support and external funding. Um, but we're also um, pleased to note in 5.5 um, um, uh, of the report that there has been additional funding identified within the high needs block for the early years. Uh, children where they have, have higher level needs or complex needs, which will take some pressure off the inclusive practice fund, which has supported all, all needs. Um, so we're just working now with, with teams um, and uh, providers on, on the application of that additional funding, which will which will be a great resource for our children that, that really do need that additional um, support um, uh, in relation to their complex needs. And finally, just um, reflecting on um, section six of the report, which talks around um, all interventions, quality training and practice um, achieved over the recent um, terms. Um, and I think we, we really need to celebrate the success of the providers and the earlier sector with everything I've just said in terms of the, the pressures that are on them. They're really trying to uh, maintain a high level of take up of funding so that children are um, school ready and uh, at, at the same time whilst battling with deployment of staff and numbers and meeting ratios there still is an absolute appetite to ensure that we are delivering the best quality that we can uh, with highly skilled practitioners to do so. Um, I refer back in the report we have had some judgments of requires improvement in adequate um, across the world in recent inspections by Ofsted and we're working with providers that has in the main been childminders that haven't had children during the COVID period so they might have closed down and paused and it's just it's just been enabling them to to get back to where they were um, then but unfortunately at the same time an inspection has come uh, and, we, and we need to do some work to support them to get the provision back to where it was. Um, but the quality and training programme that's been very well received and you can see the numbers of engagement through the report um, will go some way to ensure that uh, we are delivering quality against the sufficiency and take up of our early years across Wirral. And that is the, the, the report is for the forum to note. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Carol. And I, I think you need to be applauded for your perseverance and what was a, a really difficult situation for you and everybody in your sector during the pandemic appears to have been replaced by huge pressures economically following pandemic. There is a few uh, areas for concern. Uh, Wallasey stands out as being an area where the, the, the uptake is proportionally very low. Is there a, is it, is, what is the, cause for that do you know what is there a is there anything that that is the root cause of that poor those poor figures for Wallasey? I think there's a culmination of things um uh, as I've outlined we have had some that that's the area where we've had some provision um close uh, or has struggled to to reopen and um, we've had child minders and then there's an adjustment for families to make the decision of where they'll take their child care up um, and then if it's not where they were and it's you know, we're having to travel further afield and that's that's been the case with some inquiries that have come through they, they've not taken that provision up but it is an area of focus for the earliest team um, and uh, as I said the officers in in the Wallasey area are working very very well uh, in partnership with the sector to fully understand that and there's a survey that that will go out across the um 
the, the next few weeks, really, um, just to further understand that. We've also got, um, to add to that, um, you know, the increase in the living wage um, that is really uh, having an effect on retaining staff. Um, so th th there's just, again, all these external factors that uh, we, we, you know, we, we thought the pandemic was a difficult one. Um, but now we've got these external factors that are really uh, struggling. So we're seeing highly skilled um, staff. And, you know, when we're talking about a level three qualified practitioner, it can take you two years to get there. And then a, a high, high number have moved on to foundation degrees or degrees for a further two or three years, um, actually leaving the sector and going into retail or hospitality because that, those sectors are actually paying higher than what, what we are in terms of early education. So um, the, the, it, it's all external factors that are playing a part, and we're working very closely on the area to, to understand that further. And, and do you work with those other joined up services uh, in, in those areas where there is shortage, and, and are you getting the support that you need from us at Forum and from the local authority? Is there more that we could do to help? I would say we are getting the support. The school ready, the school ready group that I've mentioned um, is very well represented. We have schools at school admissions. Um, our colleague Sally uh, Gibbs is within there. Our health colleagues, um, our, our sector, we've had school reps. So we do. We feel we have. We have parents rep. We, we've recently also done a parent questionnaire on their um, aspirations for their little ones. Um, if they're not taking up the funding, what is their aspiration? So we feel we've kind of got all the ingredients to further analyse and understand and, and everybody's around the table. Um, but as, as much as we get set in one in, in, with one kind of um, pathway to move on to, then, then external factors come in and that can change the landscape slightly. So it feels a little bit wobbly still at the moment, but it's an improving picture in terms of take up. And at least, you know, we, we're well informed of where the gaps are and where we need to target interventions. Thank you, Carol. Any, any more questions for Carol? No, in which case, uh, we note the report and thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you, Chair. Bye, everybody. All right. Uh, so if we can move on now then to um, page, um, what other page, page 25, uh, item seven, which is the forum membership review. Um, who is taking this one? That would be me, Adrian. Fran. F thank you, Fran. I'll turn my camera on. Right, this is a regular report that is presented to Forum. Um, the first table shows the split of membership by groups and when their term runs from. There are several vacancies at the moment um, within the Academy group, but we are currently trying to follow this up. Um, and then the table at the bottom just shows who the actual members are. And we've got a new member to the group. Just bear with me, which is Catherine. Um, so we've sent all the, the welcome documents out to, to her. That's it, really. Thanks, Ron. I, I did mention that uh, we have a rep now for the post-16 vacancy as well. So that's uh, Mike yes. Kilbride from the uh, Sixth Form College. Yes, that's good. So we can amend that. So that'll be reported in September's forum. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Fran. Thank you. Any questions about that for anybody? James, you've come on screen. Are you going to make comments or have you just clipped your camera? He's Next just clipped his camera. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Uh, brilliant. So thanks for that, Fran. If we can uh, then move on to the next item agenda, item eight, which is the high needs working group update, which I believe is James. Thanks, Chair. I've also got my colleague Katie Bird on the call if there's any specific uh, questions in relation to this part or in relation to SEND as well. So this summary gives an overview in relation to the High Needs Working Group that met on the 8th of March 
and also the 10th of May. We had a specific focus during these meetings around the ongoing pressures that we have in relation to the high needs block and the demand on special school places. And there's two main parts of the report, one covering the base commissioning process that's gone on over the last three months and also the impact that has had in relation to the budget forecasting for the high needs block. So one of the local authorities priorities is to create a culture of inclusion and we're looking to we are looking to commission additional base provision with our primaries and secondaries with a specific focus on SEMA and ASD where there's that requirement that's been identified through our team, and the local authority currently receives a significant number of referrals for educational placements for these young people. In 2020-21, 25% of pupils in rural primary schools and 33.2% of pupils in rural secondary schools with special educational needs had and disability had SEMH as their primary need compared to the average of 16.5 in primary and 22.4 in secondary. And for this reason, we went through a process of trying to secure some additional base provision within our schools. And the report gives an overview in further detail as to some of the rationales as to why we did that around our EHCP numbers, specifically around SEMH and ASD. So we went through that process of trying to commission um, obviously, we wanted to make sure that the right staffing is correct within the base provision, making sure they've got the right skills and the professional development to be able to uh, facilitate what would be needed. And at the High Needs Working Group in March, we discussed the schedule for the commissioning process and representation from the High Needs Working Group to support that process, which did go ahead. At the conclusion of the base commissioning process, four schools have been successful in being awarded bases for the next academic year. St John Plessington Catholic College, where there's 12 places, Egmont Primary School, where there's 30 places, Riverside Primary School, where there's eight places, and Gannis Meadow Maintained Nursery School, where there's 12 places. The commissioning process involved officers from both education and commissioning teams. The process was clear and schools had to submit clear business cases into the reasoning why. During the High Needs Working Group on the May, in May 2022, clarity was requested in relation to the oversight of the new bases and the commissioning process to be put in place. And moderation be carried out by SEND officers through termly visits. Once established, the High Needs Working Group shared a collective desire to review the commissioning arrangements moving forward. And we can come to that later. Based on these additional base uh, provisions that we've discussed, uh, this has had an impact uh, around our projected provision within our mainstream base provision and special schools in relation to SCND. Obviously, the council has a statutory duty to provide suitable education for rural children with special educational needs. And the special educational needs and disability team have identified a need for additional places uh, due to many different areas of primary need. It's the LA's view that the most appropriate provision for the identified child will be placed uh, within the schools located within the rural community. Given this, we've had to increase our numbers uh, in relation to special schools for September to 170 places. Same colleagues are working with colleagues to make sure the additional capacity request is achievable, and we've worked really closely with our special heads to make sure that that can take place. Given this increase in base provision and special school provision for September, this table gives you an overview of our forecasting for the next five years from 21-22 in the last financial year, proposed increases and projecting out through our forecasting model that we shared with you in January, what the impact would be on our projected special, special school uh, base provision and EHCPs in mainstream and what the financial implication would be. So the projections above had an impact on the forecast in the high needs block shared with this forum in January and the expected base and special school provision has the following forecasted budget impact on the DSG. So you can see there in the table at the end of the 2021-2022, as Zacho will discuss in further detail the outturn of that budget, but ultimately the contribution to the reserve was 11k uh, deficit and therefore the surplus carried forward at the end of this financial the last financial year is 1.69 million moving forward into the next financial year we're expecting an overspend of 0.457 million uh, the surplus will go up to 2.14 that's a slight di difference in forecast better by 141,000, and that's one of the reasons for that is it came in slightly better uh, the uh, budget outturn from the last financial year. Moving forward into 2024, you'll see the max deficit is 2.664, then coming down to 2.514, and finally at the end of 2026, 1.14 million. The key implication of these changes is that the forecast position is 680k worse uh, by 2025, uh, sorry, 2025, 2026, and the deficit max position is 2.66 million. 
and therefore uh, the, the DfE have offered a diagnostic review of our current needs high needs block, but we're only in scope for the third phase of that. There are other local authorities ahead of us, and that will look at the high needs block with the intention of reducing the spend. And we will be looking closely through the high needs working group, uh, looking at different areas to try and bring that uh, deficit position of 1.14 million at 2026 to a, a balanced budget position. So there's further discussions going on. And in addition, analysis taking place in relation to out there is spending on placements by the Children's Commissioning team. And this will be strengthened by our joint Children's Commission that started last month at the Council. The High Needs Working Group will be looking at other areas of the High Needs Block in the autumn term as requested by that high needs group. So we've had a focus on base provision, special school provision. The next is the other areas, the high needs block, and if there's any savings that can be made within that uh, with that area, because actually if we can find a saving averaging out over 200K per financial year, we can bring our um, bottom line surplus to a balanced budget by 25, 26. Uh, and the recommendations of the foreign to note the report and refuse a further report from the high needs working group in the autumn term. Happy to take any questions. Thanks for that, James. Has anybody got any questions for James? Is it implicit in this, James, that there is going to be further work on the commissions to underpin those provisions as we prepare for the uh, budget setting next year? Yeah, I think obviously through this new base provision that we've set up, we've been really, really clear. And I'd like to thank the four schools that have been successful and other schools that put business cases forward. It's been really robust process. And thank you to the colleagues in the high needs working group that supported us in that commissioning process. But that was for new provision. And I think there is a, a discussion around existing provision. Uh, I know that uh, someone wanted to come in and, and obviously have a, a point on that one. Uh, Simon's got his hand in, so his hand up, sorry. So I will give way to Simon if he's got a question. But yes, that is something to look at. Okay. Simon? Uh, yeah, just uh, one little question for me. Has the did, the did the group uncover a reason why we've got so many more students with special educational needs than the national average? It's an interesting one, that, Simon, because actually from an EHCP perspective, we're, we're in line with the national average at about 3.7%. So actually our, our EHCP numbers are not, are not out of kilter with the national figure. Um, and actually... I think the, the key piece of work for us is around that graduated response, around that early support and intervention that fits with the green paper. That's really about that the earlier support. Carol's just given a, a great overview from early years, and I'm working really closely with Carol about how we can make that as early as possible. But actually, I suppose if you went for the, the statutory figures, our EHCP figures are not significantly out of line. Uh, if you look at our, and as Zacho will go in greater deal, our spend of our DSG is only 11k overspent so from a budget perspective we're pretty close given a 315 million pound budget so i think there's more in-depth work to do as part of our written statement of action in relation to send around the different work streams that will make our systems work better uh, but i hope that answers your question but happy to look at any more detail if you'd like me to that's that makes that's very clear thank you very much james uh, you've still, Sam, you've still got your hand up, so could you put your hand down, otherwise it'll confuse me. Thank you very much. Um, I, 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 the difference thing, Sam, is that we have uh, relatively more children in special placements, and that is out of kilter with, with national. Uh, that, that Those are two separate issues, aren't there? Which is probably why we need to go back and have a look at those commission services as we come to explore ways of making it more economically viable if we have to. Um, and, any more questions for James? Brilliant. Thank you very much, James. If we can move, take note of that report. And the the second part of that is that we uh, would like to receive an update. And now I'm suggesting that we go back to the November forum for the next update from this. That will give the High Needs Working Group a chance to get together again and give you more opportunity to look at those additional base placements and those underlying commissioning agreements. Is that Still OK with you, James, to go for that? Yep, if we can meet as a high needs working group in September and if schools forum are wanting us to explore uh, further those commission arrangements with the existing base, uh, existing commission um, providers through the LA, that's something we can discuss at a September high needs working group. Brilliant. And so uh, could, could the minute say that we will, we will organise a high needs working group um, as soon as we possibly can in September? Simone? 
I was just going to, to say, I think one of the things that will help us significantly as we go forward, as you will see, we're now getting much clearer predictions about the number of pupils coming through and needing support. So to this year round in commissioning the bases is a really good start. But what we want to make sure is the actual provision out there matches the needs in the right way. If children need special school provision, then we need that. But if they don't and need to be in a basis, we need to do that. I think having this advanced planning, beginning to plan from early years time and being able to track those children through their school career will allow us to develop and commission the right services. We've very much strengthened the commissioning team within the council and I'm hoping that will give us that real future ball gazing as well as better arrangements for schools both to commission with us and to make sure that the funding is paid in a timely way to provide the support that's needed. Absolutely, we all want that. And, and, and just to reassure everybody in front of that our funding isn't out of kilter. In fact, we compare quite well to the national picture. It, it, there is just lots of pressure on the high needs block nationally. I think everybody needs to remember that. Are, are we OK with that? So are we, and we and you're OK for a November report back to forum for that? Is that time enough? That's fine Excellent. by me, Adrian. Excellent. In which case, uh, note the report made those notes and there will be a high needs working group organized in september and um, that would be great okay if we move on then to uh, agenda item nine which is the budget update asaka hi um hi everyone thank you sir and i'm asaka brown senior finance business for schools and i took over this responsibility from christine thompson in March this year. So this is my first school forum. Um, the first report present is to provide an update of the school budget 2223. And in March 22, the DFE has announced the changes to the dedicated school unit allocation reflecting academy recruitment and the budget has been realigned accordingly. And bottom line of the budget is as is unchanged as agreed at January school forum. And if you if you see the 35 of the report and appendix one and show the comparison between the uh, budget agreed in January forum and revised budget and dedicated school grant has been revised from 314.44 million to 195 points. And this is purely for reflecting the academy recruitment. And other than that, it changes is an allocation of the dedicated budget. So 1.82 million move from the individual school budget to the dedicated block. And also falling roles and growth fund has been identified. And after um, following the application of the national funding formula, and this is the all update of the budget for 20 to 23. Uh, is there any question uh, I can take? Uh, so we're looking at page 35 and at the, the appendix. So has anybody got any questions for our sucker? We are all satisfied with those figures, but it is very early in the year, isn't it? So. <laughs> uh, it, 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 if nobody has any questions. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. We can we can take that report and that we will note that um, and we will review where we're up to um, at the next forum. OK, brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. If we can then move on to agenda, I, agenda item 10, which is yep. the budget outturn. Yep. And um, next report is to outline the year end position for the 21-22 school budget and starting from page 37. And account this one, this report, sorry, account on this report is not yet audited and still provisional at this moment. And the external audit is done. And as mentioned, as James mentioned earlier, overall the school budget has overspent by 11,000, which is an improvement from last forecast reported in the forum. 
and areas, I just go to the highlight of the area, areas of pressure and the report. Areas of pressures are as previously reported in high need block in special education needs statement, high needs contingency and independent special schools. And also, and as mentioned in the earlier working group update previously in Carol, the pressure from the inclusive practice fund led the earliest block to an overspend just over 400,000. And also this year, special school, special staff cost under the delegated block is was 183k overspend due to excess volume of maternity pay. And 21-22 budget includes a planned surplus of 2.68 million in the high need block to address the deficit reserve balance at the end of the financial year. There has been continued pressure on high need block and it was not able to achieve the surplus as budgeted. However, as I mentioned earlier, the overall net deficit is 11,000 only. It means that the this in the financial year, the total expenditure is almost matched with the delegate school grant allocated for the year. And the deficit of 11,000 is added to the DSG reserve and carried forward to 20 to 23 balance is a deficit of 1.69 million. This balance includes a link fenced earlier disability access fund 120,608. This is a summary of the report for Outdown 2122. Um, any questions, please? Okay, so has anybody got any questions on that report? So it's uh, been a, a good year financially for the local authority. It seems to be performing uh, slightly better than anticipated. Yeah. Uh, any, any questions for Asako on that? When, do we know when the um, auditors will finish? It's expecting uh, it's a winter, actually, a little bit late. Uh, tower. It's January, I think, that way. OK, so so uh, we will get the final report, at, uh, if we can, at the January meeting, if it will not, it will be uh, some time after that. Hopefully, it's around that, but I can't guarantee for the timing at this moment. OK, uh, that we, we, uh, it will be when it will be when they, the auditors are doing their job. Any questions about reserves or deficits that people need to raise now? No, brilliant. Thank you. In that case, we uh, note that report. Thank you very much, Asako. Thank you very much. Uh, if we can then move on to agenda item 11, which is on page 45, which is the balances, dedicated delegated school balances, which is soon. Hi, uh, so the balances report um, advisors forum of the school balances as at the 31st of March uh, 22 um, and the actions required for schools in deficit. So as at the 31st of March, the balances have increased by 2.8 million. So that's from 13.5 million as at March 21. Uh, they are now 16.3 million at March 22. Um, although the balances are high, there were 12 schools that ended the financial year with a deficit. Two of these schools are expected to set balanced budgets. Um, six schools um, have or are working towards um, an agreed licence deficit plan. Um, and four schools have um, a notice of concern and the local authority will continu continue to work with those uh, to manage their position. Uh, the local authority um, works with all schools to ensure that they have balanced budget by working with them to provide detailed projections so decisions can be made as early as possible, particularly where schools have fallen roles. Um, and that's probably about as much as I've got to say at the moment. Um, so um, the report is for noting and, um, and that we'll continue to monitor the balances. Thank you. Seem very succinct. Um, I, 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 I would make a comment on the balance position. Uh, is 
million pounds, a lot to have in held balances in schools accounts. It is the highest I remember them being. They were dropping, they dropped it to under 10 million um, and then they shot up last year um, quite considerably by about just over four or, or almost five million and they've gone up another 2.8 million. So, but I think they are higher than I can remember. I got that. Bearing, in, bearing in mind that we've got less schools because some are academies and these balances don't include academies. Yes, so I, I'm conscious that's as high as I can remember it. Mm. Um, does the local authority have a position on this? Uh, Simone? I mean, clearly schools are, are growing balances and there could be a whole range of reasons, as we know, as to why that has happened. I think what we need to do in the first instance is understand in more detail why this situation is happening. I'm aware that in the past schools have held balances perhaps for um, things such as building costs or other things or repairs. If that's big issues, we need to know about it. If they're holding balances for other reasons, then we need to understand what services they're, they're concerned about or why they're holding that back. I would very much like us to work together on this because that is a, a lot of money in the system that we think could be doing some real good for, for children. But again, it's really important that before we start to talk about it as, as money that's spurred to do something else, we need to understand what schools are actually needing to spend that on and whether we can support them in a, in a positive way. So, for instance, if they're holding it back for additional support for pupils, are we making sure that any additional support we can offer is being offered in that way, perhaps freeing some of that up then to be spent in other ways? So I'm suggesting that we contact schools, understand some more about their plans in the first place and, and look to see where possible can we help or support them if it's for building costs, if it's for other things, but at least understand what's happening in our school system and how we can best perhaps come back and discuss how as a whole system we can support children and young people as best we can with that money. I, I, I'm, I'm pleased to hear you say that, Simone, because that is an awful lot of money in the system and there, there, there should be a way of moving a, a revenue to capital if, if there is a capital infrastructure issue, but that, that's something that I think local authorities should know about, but also we're conscious that here at Forum our duty is to make sure that that funding is targeted at the children who are in the system now, so so there should be a plan around that funding as well. Uh, anybody else care to uh, comment on that situation? Uh, Sue, do we have any, any indication on the budgets being submitted to you at the moment going forward, whether that position is going to uh, change, is it going to increase, is it going in to stabilise? When, when we do the budgets, we always do three year projections. Um, one of the things we have a tendency to do is probably be quite um, pessimistic. So we might not necessarily inflate the income, but we do inflate salary costs and we take account of um, of increments. So we generally tend to find that over a period. So so they, they'll set the schools will set their budgets this year. And obviously anyone who can't set a balanced budget this year would have to go down the route of a license deficit. But their projections, we would keep an eye on those in year balances um, and make sure that they that, that that they can you know that they can still look at the possibility of set, setting uh, balanced budgets in future years. But we do tend to find that over the period, the the um, it, it 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 looks more pessimistic. I think in the in the um, no, I, I do different tables at this report than I do for other reports because in in other reports. That, that aren't relating to year end. I do show the projections and how they go down year on year. Um, and so we were expecting these balances to 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 go down, um, not massively, but we were. So it, it's about looking at those kind of things as well. Um, I'm quite happy to do some work around looking at the balances, see, see, looking at um, the sort of school balances over, over a period of time as well to see where, where the, you know, where there might be con consistently high balances and that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I, obviously it's, it's something I, I'm conscious that if we're going to the central government and saying there isn't enough money in the system, it sort of falls, the argument falls flat when we have balances that are growing, because uh, I would imagine that somebody at the centre would point to us and say, you need to spend it more wisely. 
yeah. and, and, and we, uh, you know, our interest is to support all of the children at the point they need it. Yeah. And, and, and I think that would be a piece of work that I think Forum would welcome. Uh, and any, anybody else want to make any comments on that? Um, there is a stunned silence. <laughs> OK, <laughs> um, uh, brilliant. Thank you very much for that. We know that report. Thank you, Sue. There is a hand. Um, oh, whose is it? John uh, MacDonald. It was just a question, really, about the um, the the other funding streams that are coming into schools, like the School Ed Tutor and the National Tutor. I'm just wondering how um, whether or not there's there's plenty of people at the moment they've got money that they need to spend up before the government take it back. It was just that was just a quick question really about that. Um, in relation to the 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 school led tutoring is the one that will be paid back if schools haven't um, if schools haven't spent it. Um, Sorry, so just to be clear, I was just wondering why that's why some of the schools' balances were higher than usual. No, because if they had school led tutoring or recovery premium, they should have accrued it, so it didn't affect uh, it didn't affect their balance because they 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 the grants that have to be spent on specific things, so we tend to accrue those so that so they don't inflate balances. Um, so you. you know that money the, there's been a fair amount of money transferred forward as well um, that that we don't see in balances. Thank yeah, you. Those are usually shown as a zero uh, balance they in and out funds because if they aren't fully yeah. spent, they they go out, so they yeah. wouldn't contribute to the balances. I, I don't yeah. think. That's the same with uh, PE grant as well. Is that OK for you, John? Yeah, yeah, very good. good thank you. Uh, I, I, I know the second point that, that we continue to monitor the balance, that would be a, a good thing to do. So we we'll look forward to your next report. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and moving on, we've just got the work plan at the end. Uh, any comments on that other than um, we need to put a date in for the high needs uh, working group. Is that anybody got any comments? Anybody want to contribute to that work plan? Page, whatever page we're on. Um, agenda, uh, item 12. Yes, Adrian, can I just yes, remind so everybody that the work plan does have the dates for the next uh, academic year meetings? So the dates are written on the on the work plan. They are indeed. So we, we've yeah. got all of those dates there, 27th of September for the uh, working groups, 27th of November, 17th of January. They're all there. Uh, so if we can put those in our diaries, that would be great. Yeah. Any more comments? So you'd like to say anything about that? James. It was just for, for Joe from committee services. Joe, can you get those dates put onto the council mm -hmm. <coughs> website, please, in the uh, committee diary so they're scheduled so they can be seen for the rest of the municipal year uh, and up to the 13th of June, please. That'd be really appreciated. Yeah, no problem. We'll just make the note of that in the chat. Then I'll be sending the diary invites as well as uh, getting them up on the website uh, as soon as possible. So they'll be booked in soon. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Joe. Right. Um, we are at the end of the agenda. Can I thank everybody for uh, their contributions this afternoon and this evening? And I look forward to seeing you in the new term. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks, Adrian. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, James.